Hello, everybody. Welcome to our fifth CJS lecture for the Winter 2023 series. My name is Isaac Wittenberg. I'm a second year master's student in the International and Regional Studies program, specializing in Japanese studies. And it is my great pleasure to be here with you all this evening. Before I introduce our lecturer, I've been given a few general announcements to read. Please join us tonight at 7.15 p.m., about 45 minutes after the end of this lecture, for the seventh entry in the Diamonds by the Decade, the best of CJS 75th anniversary film series, with the screening of the 1990s film Cure, directed by Kiyoshi Kurosawa. It will be shown at the State Theater in Theater 2. We hope to see some of you there. Also, one week from now, on Thursday, February 16th, we will have the next lecture in the Winter 2023 series, Technologically Well, Machine Models for Emotional Health Beyond the Human, given by Dr. Daniel White, affiliated researcher at the Department of Social Anthropology at the University of Cambridge. This lecture, like today, will only be offered via Zoom. However, it will be held at our regular noon lecture time. For our attendees, your webcams and microphones have been muted, but we invite you to use the Q&A function during the lecture to submit any questions you have, and we will try to address as many as possible. The live transcription or closed captions will be enabled, but if you would rather not have them on, you can go to the bottom right corner of your screen to disable this function. Lastly, please check out our CJS events page online or various social media platforms for CJS lectures, films, and other events scheduled this winter 2023 semester. Now that that's out of the way, um, allow me to introduce to you our speaker for today's lecture, Queer Legacies, Whether the LGBT Boom in Japan, Professor Claire Marie. Dr. Marie is professor of Japanese at the University of Melbourne's Asia Institute. Key themes of Dr. Marie's Research are the reproduction, negotiation, and constatation of identities in and through language, as well as sexual citizenship. Dr. Marie's third monograph, Queer Queen, Linguistic Excess in Japanese Media, published in 2020 by Oxford University Press, examines the editing and writing of queer excess into Japanese popular culture through mediatization of queer queen styles. Now, it is my honor to welcome Professor Claire Marie. Thank you so much, Isaac, for that wonderful uh, introduction. And good morning, uh, everyone, or good evening where you are. Um, I'm Claire Marie. I am a professor in Japanese at the University of Melbourne. Uh, my pronouns, my pronoun is her. Um, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm joining you today from the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. These are unceded lands. There's never been a treaty that has been formed in Australia. And so it's very important for us to acknowledge uh, the lands on which we uh, work and live and uh, the people who have uh, cared for these lands, waters and skies uh, for ages. Today I'm going to be talking about uh, legacies and booms in the context of the LGBT boom in Japan. I'd like to thank um, CJS for inviting me to speak this morning. And uh, what I'm presenting is uh, very much still a work in progress. So I'm hoping that we can perhaps uh, engage in discussion at the end uh, during the Q&A. Japan's well known for booms. And uh, I'm also going to be talking about legacies. And as I'm a linguist and I deal in issues of gender and sexuality, I do want to first of all acknowledge that uh, some of the content and some of the language uh, may uh, be challenging and you may uh, find offensive. Uh, please feel free to um, leave or, or come back whenever you uh, feel that you may need to. So the first term I want to talk about today is that of boom. In this presentation, I refer to booms rather than fads or trends, which is another 
uh, way that we could refer to the phenomenon that we're talking about. The Japanese term boom is used uh, very specifically to refer to reiterative and recurring fads and trends that are focused on uh, patterns of consumer Ism, and I'm also interested in thinking about how this uh, relates to uh, social justice movements when they uh, manifest as booms in contemporary Japan. The other key term that I'm using is uh, legacies. Legacy is, uh, there's two ways that this comes to my work. Uh, the first is in the uh, second here, the, the kanji here, Isan, um, which is perhaps the most normative uh, rendering or traditionalist rendering, oldest rendering that we could have for uh, a legacy in, in Japanese. So Isan is literally uh, heritage, bequest, inheritance. And it's been used sometimes within the queer community, but uh, not very often, to refer to things that are being passed across the years from older to younger members in the community. Uh, when I talk about the queer community, um, I am talking, uh, I am reclaiming the term queer. And in this presentation, I may also refer to LGBTQIA plus people, uh, gender and non-conforming people. And I'll also use the acronym SOGIESC, uh, sexual orientation, uh, gender identity expression and sex characteristics. Uh, getting back to legacy, uh, legashi, as it is here in the uh, katakana script, is um, really, it is used a lot. You know, you can think of the car, there's a legacy, um, and that the, a car that's called legacy. Uh, but here I'm also um, wanting us to orient towards the uh, idea of Olympic legacies. Olympic legacies are now a core part of the Olympic ideology and machinations of the whole Olympic movement. And this is in, um, reaction or to address issues uh, that the Olympic movement has been critiqued about in regard to the socioeconomic, cultural uh, impacts and negative impacts that um, the mega event that is the Olympics uh, and the Paralympics can have on the host uh, society, culture and communities within um, the um, Olympic sphere. So now, uh, anyone who hosts an Olympic must have a legacy plan. So I'm interested in, in putting these two together in what we might call the post 2020, remembering that the Olympics in 2020 was postponed, so it's delayed, disrupted, which is another theme that I've been working with in my work. Um, in the context of the post Olympics and in the context of the pandemic, uh, the pandemic was what? of course, caused the Olympics to be postponed and what disrupted the Olympics. Okay, so Japan is very well known for having booms. If you're in Japan, Japanese studies, if you study the language or if you know anything about Japanese culture, you will know that there are booms. Uh, we're in the midst of what may be the fifth capsule toy boom in Japan and Japanese cultural space at the moment. So when I talk about an LGBT boom, I am talking about a specific phenomenon and the acronym LGBT, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender, as it has entered into Japanese uh, mass media and into the Japanese kind of public sphere at a specific point in time. Booms are not only uh, not just queer, although there have been queer booms uh, in the past. Uh, boom is a feature of Japanese culture and indeed not just Japanese culture. But one thing as a linguist and someone who works within the space of linguistics, critical linguistics and queer uh, studies and theories is to note the linguistic elements of any boom and how it is marketed and how language is also commodified in that process. So when we think about the LGBT boom, we are thinking also about how that term has been mediatized and commodified and how it then circulates within different spheres uh, within the Japanese uh, cultural space, economic and also political space via media iterations, citations. 
So uh, media driven booms of popularity in food, sports, fashion, and even scholarly theory reoccur in uh, Japanese language and culture society economics. And through processes of commodification, um, these specific phenomena are launched as innovative and also marked as novel. The key here is that the appearance of a new boom indicates a clear cut with a previous time. So we can have, we may be encroaching on the hundredth capsule toy boom, but in each articulation, there'll be something that is marketed as innov innovative and novel. And in doing so, we're cutting away histories. And that's an important part of what we want to think about when we think about legacies in relation to uh, LGBT communities and issues to do with Sojiesk uh, in contemporary Japan. So what does it mean when social justice movements manifest as booms is one of the questions I want to think about today. And the other question is, how can we understand this in the context of legacy building? So as I've said, booms are processes of commodification, which depend on dis discourses of innovation and market novelty as a core component of the boom. Booms therefore mask histories of consumption, they mask uh, histories of transnational collect connections, and they can also mask intergenerational links. So the LGBT boom, what was it? Why am I referring it to as a boom? And uh, how can we think about it critically through examining um, language and how it's circulated in the media? The acronym LGBT wasn't used widely in the public domain until around the 2010s. There are examples where we can see LGBT being used within uh, queer community spaces, organizing um, within the community and also events and so on. But it wasn't used widely in the public domain until the mid 20 Tens. And this is when there was a wave of preparation for the 2020 Tokyo Olympic and Paralympic Games. So I'm going to refer to these as the 2020 Games, even though they were actually not held in 2020. So the 2020 Games propelled an LGBT boom. So that's always in inverted commas. It's a term that has been used to uh, refer to this particular phenomenon. Companies and service providers were urged to take advantage of the LGBT market, again, in inverted commas, like documentary and news variety, television shows delved into the issues faced by LGBT people in Japan. And um, an important part of the discussion today is to understand that although the LGBT boom happens in the mid 20 tens around from around 2015, the term boom is integral to understanding the commercial uh, cultural flows of queerness in contemporary Japan, not least because articulations of the recycling of the queer queen, um, which I talk about in my book of 2020, uh, such as we have the 1990s gay boom, gay boom, the 20. Uh, in the millennium around 2005, the Orne Kara boom, which is the queer personality boom. And then uh, from around 2013 to 2017 and beyond, we have the LGBT boom, the LGBT boom. And they've all been labeled as booms. So booms are integral because uh, not only is there repetition and repeated reoccurring booms around things to do with queer issues, but also because repetition is characteristic of commodity culture, quoting Jameson and Apadura there. Media studies, as Steinberg writes, have scholars have shown that cycles of novelty and obsolescence are fully part of consumption in Japan. 
And Yoshimoto, writing in 1989 around scholarly booms, notes that in a discussion of intellectual booms, within cycles of boom, a new difference is artificially created to be exploited through the process of mass commodification. Once the process of mass commodification have nullified any artificially created differences, and I'm citing from my book here, another boom is manufactured. So the idea that there is something different happening in these booms, that it's not the same thing, uh, there is something that is never being seen before, never been experienced before. And this is the way that there is uh, artificially a uh, difference is created and another boom is manufactured. So yesteryear's gay boom makes way for, for today's queen personality boom and tomorrow's LGBT boom and so on. Now the term gay itself, if we think back to the original uh, gay boom, which is in the 1990s, um, can actually be traced further. And Mark McClelland argues that the original gay boom happened in occupation Japan. Here, the term gay enters not as a term from the North, North American gay rights movement, as we could argue it has in the 1990s, but as a slang term, which plays on the English word gay and also on the Japanese gay, which uh, refers to art forms and entertainment. Dictionary definitions of this usage of gay trace it back to um, a film, uh, sorry, The Beast to Die, which has had film adaptations, including 1959, directed by um, Sugawa Ezo. We can see that also the term gay boy originating um, around about this time is um, another iteration of the uh, usage of gay and the many different meanings that it has had over time. Watanabe Katsumi is well known for his uh, work. Um, he was a drifting photographer of the Shinjuku area and his work captures the people of the nocturnal uh, Shinjuku world and it captures so-called gay boys posing in front of clubs and bars in the Shinjuku area. So, in his introduction to the end of Cool Japan, Mark McClelland writes that um, interest in sex and gender nonconformity was hardly a contemporary trend in the current period, but that it's been evident across a range of Japanese media since content restrictions, excepting politically uh, sensitive issues, were lifted in the occupation since a period in 1945. We can also uh, talk about another form of boom, the dancehall boom or the genderless boom of the 2010s. And here we can turn to Michelle Ho's work on dancehall and genderless danshi and genderless joshi. Dancehall being cross-dressing male in male garb, genderless danshi being a reference to genderless boys and genderless joshi being a reference to genderless girls. Now, genderless and the terms, the binary terms here are in a little bit of contestation, uh, but uh, we will put that to the side for the moment. This genderless boom, the boom in everything to do with genderless personalities, demonstrates the cyclical nature of categorization and classification. Ho argues that individual practices may resist this labeling, and yet they come to embody it through practices of mediatization and argues that this is a, there is a long linear component to this dancehall boom. Who argues that the dancehall boom is pre-gay because it has a long history in Japan and uh, dating back to uh, practices by warriors and members of the royal family. And also claims that at the same time, danso practices by young individuals in 21st century Japan, uh, danso culture, as he refers to them in a paper in 2020, are also post-queer. So we have a pre-gay, post-queer kind of formulation that Ho is wanting us to be aware of here. And the key here is that by market processes, 
these local gender and sex cultures also different from pre-modern eroticisms. So we have an extension beyond pre-gay and post-queer queer, queer, to suggest that there's a non-linear temporality that's enabled by and fracturing from historical traditions, but simultaneously subject to capitalist modes of production. So this enabling and fracturing is also something that we need to keep in our minds as we think about uh, the issue of booms and legacies in uh, my talk today. Both McClellan's and Ho's work point to the non-linear and transnational nature of subcultural uh, categorization. And they also point to the shifts in meanings and usages of language and processes of language commodification, which transform form meaning. So language commodification is when language itself or terms itself become commodities, a part of what we consume and can circulate in markets. So yesterday's gay differs slightly from the meaning of 1990s gay. And that is because language and meanings alter and shift over time. LGBT boom in Japan and the term in L the term itself LGBT is also operating in a specific way within uh, Japanese uh, contemporary media. Okay, so let's have a, a little look again at the LGBT boom. And I have on the screen three examples of um, what I would like us to think about in terms of language commodification and processes of transformation. So language commodification is uh, a commodification, an objectification of language. Commodified language is always ready to move, Shankar and Kavanagh. It moves beyond, beyond local communities and societies into national and global contexts. And it moves to levels at which uh, language use can be uh, difficult to analyze. It can also be resisted, commodification and the meanings that are given to specific terms as part of that can be resisted. And uh, these, as Laura Miller's work on girls' graphs illustrates, once a form of resistance, what was once a form of resistance can circulate in mass produced versions even after the trend or the fashion is in decline. So I use the term labor, language labor, which we can see here, sorry, to refer to processes, collaborative linguistic practices and processes by which uh, media and commodification of language and, and identities operates. So the collaborative work by those who produce complex multiple multimodal texts, and by that I mean texts which contain different modes of communication, the visual, the audio, and uh, perhaps uh, other senses as well. If we focus on language labor, we have to think about how public discourse situates social, cultural, and political groups in relation to domestic and international affairs through these collaborative linguistic processes. Collaborative writing and editing are essential components of language labor in the commercial domain of media production and consumption, translation and interpretation. And these processes are enacted over multiple sites national, cultural, social, and even personal identities can be con constituted, negotiated, and contested through these processes of language labor. And that these have real life world effects on local, regional, and global understandings of people and even of things such as nations. So let's have a look at uh, a couple of examples that I discuss 
in a chapter in 2010, uh, sorry, 2018. We have on the screen here examples of uh, explanations of the term LGBT. Uh, they're all from uh, 2015, which we could perhaps say is kind of the peak of this boom. And this is the time when the term LGBT saturated sections of the visual sphere within uh, mainstream media. And my argument is that this introduction, this explanation, this continuous citation of what is LGBT? Oh, let me explain. Pivots on a continuous and continuing invisibility and points us to think about the issues of hyper visibility. So on June uh, 7, 2015, the weekly news and current affairs program, Shinso Hodo Bankisha, which I refer to Bankisha, and that's the screenshot there, aired a 15 minute segment on LGBT social understanding, familial understanding, LGBT, shakai no rikai, kazoku no rikai. In the opening segment, a digital monitor that blends both the quiz format and the informational format of the flip card, and flip cards are usually looking like this. This is from the NHK program Saki Dori. Um, in the introduction, this is used, there's a digital one here. Uh, this is usually it's paper, but recently we have digital versions as well, is used to uh, introduce and explain the LGBT acronym. So unlike the paper-based flip cards, which are usually held, um, the digital monitors are multifunctional. They can display both text and graphic like the flip cards. They can also be used as prompters and they can retake um, displays on location. So this change in technology alters in how they are also uh, used. So um, the uh, one that's being used here, we can see that the announcer is introducing the terms LGBT, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. We can see next to bisexual, we have um, the term in Jose uh, I, and next to transgender, we have Se Doitsu, Shogai, Sono Hoka. This is uh, a problematic rendering of transgender that uh, reappears again and again in discourse, public discourse in particular around LGBT peoples and issues. So the digital monitor is used to uh, in the opening and then the camera pans out and we can see, you can see in the background there, um, actress, uh, different photographs that are up on the behind the announcer. And um, the other announcer uh, begins to narrate actress Jodie Foster, singer Elton John, Apple CEO, Tom Cook, swimmer, Ian Thorpe. So do you know what these people all have in common? And that's the lead uh, to begin to think about LGBT issues. He continues uh, by saying, oh, right, the answer is, and we get this wide shot, to uh, say LGBT is displayed again, and this LGBT and the like sexual minorities. So after this staged introduction, the camera shifts, and that's what we're seeing on the screen here to uh, explain LGBT. L is lesbian, women attracted to each other, gay is gay, men attracted to each other, and B is bisexual those who are attracted regardless of whether male or female. It's all very gender binary. T is transgender, which means GID, which is um, a problematic term and others whose gender identity and sex are different. So we have the transliterations that appear on the screen there. What I'm really interested in uh, impressing on us today is that the examples of the well-known personalities preface what I uh, interpret or critique as an educational uh, approach. There's an educational force to the explanation, which is not only in this show, but in the other ones that are up on the screen. Viewers are situated as pupils, as if they don't know 
right? Uh, viewers are situated as being schooled in all things LGBT. We have the schooling being done through the digital technologies, through the use of text in this way within the space. The program uh, Bankisha actually stresses the progress that's being made in the area of partnership recognition. However, it also seeks to question the feelings and experience of quote unquote LGBT people and the like. So I'm going to skip forward to show you an example. Um, and this is a rendering of the screen and the text that appears, it's heavily layered. Much Japanese television is heavily layered. And my argument is that this frames the way that uh, viewers are expected to understand um, LGBT issues. And this also frames the way that discourse around sexual citizenship, that is the rights and responsibilities of people who reside in a specific uh, region or location or country can um, have access to or not, uh, and that is predicated on gender and sexual orientation, uh, gender identity, uh, expression and sex characteristics. So we can see here that we've got the upper left of the screen, we've got the uh, program logo, we've got understanding around LGBT in the midst of huge changes, facts. So there's this sensationalization that appears on the top left and top right of the screen and that frames the whole program itself. Down the bottom, we also have another line of script. Tokyo Rainbow Pride, an event to deepen understanding and eliminate discrimination of LGBT and the like. And you can see here, I've got these um, different um, symbols. You can see the key down the bottom, which indicates that there's a change in text color. So this change in text color is happening around LGBT or Menguru Dikai, understanding around LGBT is being visually highlighted. LGBT, the term is also in a different color that's also being visually highlighted. So we have this reiteration, this citation, this layering of the term LGBT onto the screen in the form of text. And we also have the narration as well. So the uh, scene is going to Tokyo well, Rainbow Pride and we basically have this, the narration also explaining that this is an event to deepen understanding about and eliminate prejudice towards LGBT people of sexual minorities. I'm really interested um, in this uh, use also of the term like and the like, nado, LGBT nado. I mean, what is it really doing here? Is it an attempt to uh, have LGBTQIA+, and the plus on the end of LGBTQIA+, gives us the, the understanding that there are identities that people have yet to be empowered to voice or who have yet, have yet to be empowered to name in a way that feels um, true to their being. Okay, so that gives you an example of the language labor. This is one small screw, one screen of Japanese TV and the labor that has gone into the um, editing of that, selecting the text that will be layered onto the screen, layering that text onto the screen. And this all flows when we're watching the audio visual as if it's happening simultaneously with what's happening on the screen. It appears natural. It appears as if just the way it should be. But you can see the techniques here of using different fonts, using different colors, framing visually the screen are directing us to understand this in a specific way. So the LGBT boom, and those are just a couple of examples that I've given here, um, is all about visualizing, being seen. And within queer politics, this idea of being seen is, is very important. But the LGBT boom is in, in, 
in effect um, making uh, LGBT uh, people or issues hyper visible. So what's, what's the difference? What's the difference between visibility, we need to be seen, we need to be understood, we need to be heard, and hyper visibility. Hyper visibility is when the issue, the people seem to be everywhere and they're actually not many places at all. So we get this feeling that everything is about LGBT at the moment, when in fact, although we're being bombarded with it in the media, there is a very limited real life experience of that and a kind of still emerging engagement with issues and with legislative uh, change. So the idea of this hyper visibility pivots on a continuous and a continuing invisibility. The other key point here is that it also relies on developing and further strengthening discourses of tolerance. So the, the discourse of tolerance here is, of course, has also been called out in relation to the 1990s um, gay boom, in particular by Kakefuda Hiroko, who, um, you know, really points out well that the idea that this visibility and invisibility work hand in hand, and if these issues are not seen, then there is no issue. And the flip side of that is because they are everywhere, then it is demonstrative of the fact that the society is already tolerant. Okay. So in 2018, the term LGBT enters what is considered one of the most loved uh, dictionaries of Japanese and the definition of lie, love is also redefined. Important note of this is that the definition that is given to LGBT is incorrect and transgender is lumped with LGB. So it, um, transgender is also kind of conflated with issues of sexuality and uh, the agenda element is um, negated in that process. Quickly there is, um, an adjustment and an amendment is made to that definition. But you can see this happening throughout the uh, descriptions and the explanations of LGBT that occur during the boom years. So what about legacies? What about legacies? I spent so much time talking about booms. Hey, Claire, what about the legacies? Well, the legacies are an important part of the Olympic movement. And we can see the celebrations as Tokyo is announced as the host of the 2020 games. And we can see the use of uh, the um, emblems to uh, really impress unity in diversity, unity in diversity. So the key overarching, and that's not just for the Tokyo 2020 games, but also for other ones is this idea of diversity and unity in diversity. Within this, LGBT is uh, there is a necessity to address issues to do with sexual orientation. And um, for many people who are not uh, kind of up with, with queer issues um, within the Olympic Charter, uh, this is included um, following the Sochi Olympics. And um, this means that any host city must, every host city must um, adhere to the anti-discrimination clause, clause six um, of the charter. And here it's very clearly stated race, color, sex, sexual orientation, language, religion, political, or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth, or other status. So the rebranding of LGBT is not just um, in the terms uh, in, in regard to uh, rights, but also in regards to markets. And this is linked heavily 
to the 2020 games, which are framed as the recovery games, recovering from the uh, 2011 earthquake and from the lost 30 years of a Japanese economic um, decline. LGBT is very clearly stated. We can see it down here um, with um, Koike talking about the importance of diversity and the three qualities that um, must be impressed um, on visitors and participants in the 2020 games. The second quality is diversity and I'm reading here. There is a need to create a city in which, which men, women, children and adults, as well as persons with disabilities and LGBT people, people can all shine equally. As part of this, we have a slate of, um, of uh, initiatives. One of them is around uh, marriage equality and a first step towards that um, being uh, the registration of uh, same sex, same gender partners with local government bodies and also the launch of the uh, diet caucus into LGBT issues. A very important part of understanding this is in the um, at the launch LDP um, politician Hase Hiroshi actually states that before the Tokyo Olympics, Paralympics, we need to have this caucus to show that there is no discrimination against LGBT people. So the idea is that we need to show that there is nothing. It's not that we're going to enact. It's not that we're going to make sure there is no, but we need to actually show people, right? So that's an important part. This links into why we need to think about the boom in the context of legacies. Around about the same time, the, LDB, the LDP also releases its points of view around diversity, sexual identity and gender identity. And it makes very clear that it has a very uh, strange relationship with this. The direction to aim for um, is not one in which uh, people can um, come out, but where there is no need to come out. We're already tolerant, Japan has, has already demonstrated that there's a long history of tolerance towards queer people. And uh, we really don't want to, um, you know, make too much of an inroad into legislative change. However, around this time, there is also a lot of advocacy and a lot of lobbying. And a lot of this is supported by great work that is done in, from consulting firms to actually demonstrate the level of discrimination and the um, issues that people face um, in their workplaces and so on. So for example, I've shown the experiences of harassment in the current workplace uh, from 2018, uh, power harassment, reference to appearance and demeanor, sexual jokes, reference to partner or plans for marriage and having children. And the figures there uh, indicate the percentage of uh, respondents who indicate that they have experienced this. It's interesting here to note that LGB, lesbian, gay and bisexual and transgender T are separated. This is also a really important uh, demonstration of the different um, challenges that uh, different uh, people who fall under the rainbow umbrella experience. There was a big campaign to raise awareness of what was called Soji Hara, Soji becoming uh, coming from sexual orientation and gender identity and hara coming from harassment. And uh, the uh, labor uh, laws were um, slightly amended to include soji harassment in um, anti-bullying um, in the workplace legislation that came into force in 2021. So what does it mean when social justice movements manifest as booms and how can we understand them? We need to understand that there is a long history of advocacy and change in Japan. 
But we also need to understand that there is a legacy and a conservative backlash, which has been ongoing from the 1990s. And even though there has been very limited legislative change, um, for example, in the midst of the boom, um, Sugita Mio, an LDP politician, uh, wrote a very controversial um, article saying that support for LGBT has gone too far. But you see the way that this term is being used here as well. So this is discrimination and people gathered to demonstrate and to apologize. And we find that um, after the initial LGBT boom, as we get closer to uh, the 2020 Olympics, uh, the media uh, begins to perhaps uh, give a greater voice to demonstrations and activism that is happening on the ground. And we have the Love Parade in 2018, which is uh, to um, say thank you to the Tokyo Municipal Government for passing an anti-speech uh, and anti-harassment uh, Okay, so in the, um, sorry, in the uh, building legacies, um, it's very important to note that this history of activism and this history of lobbying is actually uh, predates any boom. So booms want to kind of demonstrate this is new, this is innovative. But discourse around, for example, same partnership, same sex partnerships, same gender partnerships, rights, we can trace it back to at least the 1990s. And we can go further back in history to see how people in the 1920s, 1930s uh, kind of negotiated the space of the family registration to enable them to uh, kind of form a family. Now, there are limitations to that, as we all know. However, the advocacy and bullying, uh, lobbying has led to greater understanding around bullying, has led to inroads such as the Rainbow Diet Initiative, and has led to uh, soji harassment being included in uh, the vocabulary and also legislation. However, one uh, key thing that has also happened and it's emerging emerging in the moment as we speak is around the cross party bill to understand uh, to promote understanding of sexual minorities in Japan this was abandoned in may 2021 本当に民法の形での話ですね。それはもうご理解ある方もそうですし、あの、今は理解が足りていないという方もそうなんですけど、全ての方に実際に持ち込んでいただきたいんですね。そのためにですね。それをやるという原点を受けも、そういうね、差
become tokens in the politics of diversity inclusion as symbols of change without real legislative change. Okay, so we have the um, example of um, backlash discourse coming at the end of this presentation, which shows that these, uh, this discourse and rhetoric of tolerance is um, masking uh, a very clear and um, obstructive discriminatory view of um, homosexuality in contemporary Japan. So if we fast forward to 2023, just a few days ago, the Prime Minister commented that marriage equality will, unfortunately, change society. And when talking off record an aide to uh, the Prime Minister commented that they would hate just seeing them, them being LGBT people, and they would hate for them, LGBT people, to live in the neighbourhood. Uh, LGBT groups and activists across the country have mobilized and called for uh, apologies and uh, for this. I'm just going to leave here with a national survey conducted in 2019 to show the mismatch. So when we think about this hyper visibility, even though I'm being quite critical, I do also want to impress in the ways that um, surveys um, show and indicate that attitudes towards sexual minorities in Japan are shifting. So to the question that is it strange for someone to hold romantic feelings for the same and or both gender or to have no romantic feelings, we can see that 70% of respondents disagree or are neutral. To the question of how would you feel if someone you know is homosexual, bisexual, and or transgender, we see that in a case of a friend, only 33% of respondents agreed to feeling antipathy, and that this has reduced from 50%, it was 50% in 2015. Younger age groups demonstrate less antipathy, and respondents expressed greater dislike to a child or sibling being homosexual, bisexual, and or transgender. And it's really important that this term yada is the same term that was used by the aid when they were talking about the fact that they wouldn't like or they would hate or they would dislike an LGBT person um, living in their neighborhood. Marriage equality is also in the news at the moment and in the most recent survey, 83.8% .8 of 20 to 30 year olds who responded agreed with marriage equality. And there's been an overall increase of 13.6 points since 2015. So what does it mean when social justice movements manifests of booms? It means that we have to think of issues of hyper visibility and invisibility, that we have to think about tolerance in the context of backlash. How can we understand this in the context of legacy building? We need to think about the imperative of diversity inclusion within a disrupted games and challenges to legislative, legislative um, change. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Marie, for that wonderful presentation. Um, now we will begin our Q&A session. Um, if you have any questions, please leave them down in uh, through the Q&A function. Um, we do have one uh, from Dr. Alexi. Uh, she says, thank you so much for this presentation and as always for your fantastic work. It's always a pleasure to get to learn more from you. Uh, she asks, 
I wonder how each of the LGBT categories might figure differently into the dynamics you're describing, specifically around visibility, hypervisibility. I'm wondering about how, say, gay and lesbian people might encounter that differently. Just in the last few weeks in the US, uh, she says that she's noticed a number of adverts featuring uh, wealthy looking gay men, but haven't ever seen ads featuring butch women couples. Are there any patterns you've noticed in the representations and media mentions? Thanks very much for a fantastic um, question. Uh, yes, there are um, kind of dynamics and patterns around um, representations. And I think one of the things that an LGBT boom does is that it flattens all of the, the rich diversity um, of people who might fall under an umbrella that is LGBT and that we actually need to expand um, to think about LGBTQIA plus in the context of Japan as well. So, um, I mean, there's there's a kind of research that looks around um, how can we think of this perhaps in terms of homo nationalism, but is that a term because it's been used in relationship to the politics of the USA um, post 9-11? Is that something that we can use in relation to Japan? Um, I would say that we can learn from that discourse. So homo nationalism is really about how representations and how types, you know, the ideal kind of citizen type is um, very much uh, a white, um, able-bodied and uh, kind of middle income to wealthier consumers who are participating in neoliberal economics and structures of work, et cetera, et cetera. And it's just kind of been, been expanded to include the good gay and lesbian people um, at the expense of um, vilifying and othering um, people from, uh, in the context of 9-11, from the so-called Middle East um, and um, Islamic uh, regions of perhaps Asia as well. So how can we think about that in terms of uh, representations of Japan? Well, it's a very much able-bodied, uh, younger um, people who are featured as part of um, the discourse or the representations of LGBT. And at the kind of height of the discourse around partnerships, uh, we did see representations of um, women and they were mostly interpolated or thrust into discourses that focused on, uh, you know, marriage and also uh, the importance of, of bringing up children. So there was also that kind of gendered uh, representation as well. I'm not sure if that quite answers the question, but I hope it gets us thinking a little bit more around that as well. Great. Um, our next question, someone said, I feel a bit conflicted regarding hypervisibility as it appears that individuals at least in the survey towards the end of the presentation, there is an increase in acceptance slash support for LGBT in Japan. Uh, they say, I understand uh, that being hypervisible can lead to backlash, but is public backlash not better than pent up disagreement? Oh, thanks, that's a, a really great question. Well, um, I understand that feeling of being conflicted because uh, a lot of, for example, um, a lot of activism and a lot of awareness raising, raising in different parts of the international community has all been about uh, raising visibility, making sure that we are seen marching on the streets um, and also appealing to issues through being there and being counted. I think that 
what hyper visual hyper um, visibility does, and uh, we learn a lot from um, black feminism in regard to this, is that the the tokenism, um, you know, suddenly an individual is seen to be you know stand out much much more and be expected to take on so much more than uh, the kind of the mainstream um, and non-othered, the minoritized uh, becomes this kind of seen everywhere, but actually not given any rights, not given any um, of the responsibility and care, and it actually experiences greater violence, uh, greater tensions in different, you know, interpersonal relationships, workplace relationships, on the street, et cetera, et cetera. So the important thing about the backlash is that the backlash in Japan starts in the 19, late 1990s and um, it is ongoing today. So backlash discourse always uh, has traditionally within feminism talked about a reaction, like it's a reaction to when there's change and things improve. Um, we don't kind of see that legislative change in Japan to the, to the same degree. Um, and the other thing is that in relation to understandings and acceptance, I don't really like that word, of LGBTQIA plus uh, peoples in Japan, there's often this discourse that talks about, oh, it's always been tolerant. You don't see the levels of, um, of violence that you see in other places. It's all kind of good. Having been involved with um, grassroots uh, community activism in Japan, I can kind of say that that's not the full story. We don't hear a lot about the gendered violence that happens in Japan. And, and that's kind of well known within feminist and queer studies. We don't hear the stories from um, people who are uh, severely disadvantaged in their family situations and experience um, great uh, pain and suffering at the hands of the, the family system. So we have the, the kind of the backlash that is pushed by um, ultra conservative forces playing on this idea of the family. So if we go back to the um, surveys, what we're seeing is yes, there is an, kind of an increase in acceptance um, of things such as um, marriage equality, um, and that's coming to the forefront now, but marriage equality does not mean that all of the issues that queer people face suddenly disappear. We know that from the Australian example, and I'm sure that you know it from the USA example as well. Um, so where am I going with this? I think it is conflicted because we also see, and as we saw in the aid, I don't want them in my neighborhood. People in the survey are saying, yeah, I'm fine as long as it's not in my family, right? So that's the other side of that. So I think it's it's really it's really tricky. Yeah, we need to be visible. We need to be um, out there. We need to make our claims heard. But when it's done as a consumption commodified, oh, we've all heard enough about LGBT now. It's finished. Then I think that we've got to really be um, on our toes and think about it as well. Sorry. I got a bit excited there, which means that it was a fantastic question. Thank you so much. Thank you. We love that you're excited about this. We're excited about this. Um, the next comment slash question, uh, someone said, thanks, Claire, amazing presentation. How do you think the positive trajectory in youth attitudes towards marriage equality and LGBTQ normalization relates to LGBTQ plus legacy and boom, does it say something about the legacy of gay booms, either as a kind of beneficial ignorance, i.e. they haven't been exposed to previous hypervisibility or backlash, or more as a function of contemporary activism and education? Hmm. Um, that's a really great question. And I'm just trying to think off the top of my head. Um, I think that I haven't talked about it today, but it is something that I 
discuss a lot, uh, especially recently, is that there has been a lot of work done in the education um, field, in the field of kind of education um, itself. Uh, Japan is a signature to uh, human rights charters. And so therefore it's duty bound to actually act on human rights issues. And it's just again, recently received, you know, uh, from the UN, a little nudge again to say that it needs to focus on issues to do with um, Sojiesk and also to do with um, the rights of uh, foreign nationals who are um, incarcerated in Japan. Okay. So what am I saying is that this, this activism and education, I think, has made inroads in many ways that people who aren't in the field don't actually see. So because Japan must adhere to uh, human rights conventions, um, that means that within, for example, um, compulsory education, um, it must then not discriminate against those who have um, different, uh, for example, disabilities, um, gender, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the um, special legislation that is uh, put into action in the early 2000s um, that enables people who fit, who uh, have uh, certain, there are certain, um, things that they must they must be over 18 for example they cannot be married their children um etc cetera, etc cetera, um are able to legally um change their registration of their gender so gender affirmation is possible and surgical intervention is also part of that it must be done in order for this to happen this means this is framed as a uh, shogai which is disability and because of this, it means that within compulsory education, schools cannot discriminate against children. The, the kind of the catch here is that you cannot do, do this until you're over 18. So in the interim years, compulsory education up to high school and university, um, then there needs to be something within the system that actually um, attends to the needs of those uh, students. So this is where within the education and educators themselves have uh, been able to create um, avenues and pathways for uh, educating young people. And I think that that is important. And I also think that this hypervisualization, uh, like the first um, commentator or the first question um, kind of hinted at, I mean, it's not it, the having queer people on TV is not a bad thing. I mean, it's just not a bad thing. Thanks. Great. Um, our next question asks, this might be beyond the scope of your project, but could you please talk more about the possibilities for social activism, given the dynamics you've identified? How are activists pushing back against media booms? Yeah, thanks so much. I think that the um, the key here is the way that uh, activists specifically have been using alternative media and have also been um, using um, channels of lobbying. So the rainbow diet is a really good example of that. And um, actually, you know, really lobbying um, different uh, members of parliament and different groups to um, raise understanding of, uh, of the issues that need to be addressed. Uh, the big one at the moment is centering around uh, marriage equality and also the bill that was not uh, put to parliament, that was abandoned. Uh, now there's a lot that we could talk about in regards to that bill because it wasn't an anti-discrimination bill. It was a, a bill that would be used to facilitate greater understanding, dikai sokshin, greater understanding. Uh, I mean, words fail me at the um, inadequacy of that in contemporary Japan, but um, 
the way that people are also um, using media at the moment, although we do have problems with the great, great T uh, microblogging side at the moment, is actually to appeal to uh, people in the younger age group and people who are interconnected online and to um, you know, use tools that have been successful in other legislative um, arenas, for example, Taiwan um, and other places. Thank you. Uh, thank you. The next question uh, someone asked in regards to the survey at the end, is there a stronger acceptance of LGBT within the younger generation? If so, do you have the numbers that show some of the splits of acceptance versus yada between generations? And also thank you for answering my previous question. That makes a lot of sense. Um, yes, from memory there are. Um, and um, this is from a survey that's been done by colleagues. Um, working in Japan. Um, I am not sure if I could put that in the chat. I've just put it in our behind the scenes chat, the, um, the reference for that. Um, it's in Japanese, unfortunately. Um, however, I think you can probably access some of that online. Um, I have to say that sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit wary of trying to, um, of, kind of suggest that uh, there is a huge intergenerational difference uh, because there is a really long history of, of activism in Japan. And there are uh, lots of older people who have made pathways forward. And I think part of what happens with this boom, this new innovative, it's new, it's, it's fresh, it's all the young kids doing all of these things. It actually cuts off the histories that are there. Uh, that's a whole other talk that I could give. I've been focused more on media today, but that is actually, I think, a problematic. There are a, there are numbers of people who have have um, done amazing work. They're in their seventies. They might be in their eighties, and they have done a lot of work in this space. Um, so, yeah, um, I just wanted to put that out there as well. Thank you. Our next question. Uh, someone said, thank you for your excellent lecture. Would you mind speaking about the media visibility of or general societal attitudes towards LGBTQ people in assumed straight and or cis relationships, such as bisexual women married to a man? Yeah, thanks. That's a great um, that's a great question. I think the very fact that LGBT is the term that has been taken up by the media um, and that it is now, people refer to them as LGBTs with an S on the end, um, kind of gives an indication of, of the way that everything is kind of mashed in together, right? Um, so uh, assumed straight or assumed cis relationships uh, are probably read as, uh, as normative by a large number of people. But there has been a very um, strong, uh, for example, bisexual women's um, uh, kind of community, uh, particularly emerging from the 1990s. And there's also a very strong uh, trans community um, and very diverse trans community, trans act activists doing a lot of work. I suppose the overarching thing to remember is that within Japanese socio-political context, the family registration is kind of a key pivotal part of this whole discussion. And the family registration is, is kind of the, the core institution of how people are seen to be related to each other. And there's a lot of um, things that you can uh, do as family members legally rec uh, recognized family members on the same registry. But there are a lot of limitations. There's fluidity and there are also limitations within that. So if you are kind of understood as family, then there are many um, rights and responsibilities that are opened up to you and uh, imposed on you as well. Thank you. Great. 
Um, we still have about 13 minutes. And while we're waiting for some other questions and comments to pop in, I had a question of my own um, regarding your presentation. Uh, I was curious how these LGBT booms and um, this more media coverage has had an effect on uh, gender and sexuality studies in Japan, whether um, you as an academic have seen more of an interest in the course of your research in these areas and um, sort of how that might play into the future of um, LGBTQ studies or uh, gender sexuality studies in Japan. Yeah, thanks. That's a really interesting question. Um, I think that um, queer theories and queer studies in Japan um, has uh, a quite complex history um, within the academy in uh, Japan itself. Uh, so without going into too many details, um, it's quite difficult to do queer research in Japan. Um, however, uh, many people have tried and attempted and opened up the space uh, such that it is comparatively um, less problematic than it was before. The issue that we face within perhaps queer studies, LGBT, QIA plus studies, gender sexuality studies, feminism in Japan is around um, the backlash, the anti-gender, anti-trans backlash in particular at the moment, and um, trans exclusive feminism and its impact on uh, public discourse is also uh, quite a problematic space uh, in terms of sexuality slash gender studies in Japan it, uh, right now. Um, so I think that there are more, um, for example, undergraduate students uh, uh, don't demonstrate the same sense of um, disorientation or um, a kind of disconnect when, uh, for example, I might give a lecture that talks about LGBT issues. Uh, however, there's often a sense that it is not something that is uh, to do with them. So there's kind of this, unless you identify as falling within the rainbow umbrella, if we wanna call it that, then it's not really your problem is, is kind of, but I mean, that's how it works. Uh, in many places, unfortunately, still today. I think the number of, um, for example, honors thesis, uh, MA thesis, PhD thesis that deal with um, gender slash sexuality in the context of Japan is growing. Uh, but one still needs to be aware that there is a backlash um, against um, feminism and against gender studies that um, is quite uh, overarching in Japanese academia. So I think that uh, we have more allies and I feel that we have more allies. However, I still have not been able to um, feel that there is an overwhelming support for research in this space. Um, that means that I, I need to do better. I need to support people better. Um, I need to facilitate um, you know, really having more work done by um, mentoring, if I can, um, anyone who wants to do work in this area and uh, being able to perhaps uh, help them navigate what can be a difficult space. Thank you. Great. Thank you uh, for that answer. We have about uh, seven minutes left or so. Um, if there's uh, no other questions that anyone has, um, I guess we will be wrapping up the webinar for today. I want to give a big thanks to Dr. Claire Marie for being here today and for your presentation. And, oh, actually, um, oh, one more question just popped up. Um, 
Someone said, thank you for a great talk. How has the pandemic impacted the LGBT boom? Thanks, that's a really great question. Um, I think that what it has highlighted is uh, the necessity for creating spaces and raising awareness of the uh, possible trauma that uh, particularly young people and those who are um, in um, less supportive environments face um, during, for example, times of lockdown. I think that that's something that has been made abundantly clear to all of us. So in the context of Japan, um, Pride House Tokyo Legacy was um, scheduled to open after the Olympics. Pride House, if you don't know, is um, a kind of initiative that grew um, from uh, mega events uh, held like Olympic in um, Canada from memory. Sorry, I don't have my notes with me on the history. Um, and there have been Pride Houses that have been uh, established uh, you know, in London and Korea around times of, of the um, Olympics and Paralympics. So as a movement, the Pride House is to support uh, LGBTQIA plus people in the host city and also uh, facilitate support and uh, raise awareness around LGBTQIA plus athletes um, in the Olympics and Paralympics. So uh, legacy, it's a great, it's a great name for the Pride House initiative in Tokyo, scheduled to happen open after the Olympics. The Olympics was postponed, but the opening of Pride House was pushed forward because of the results of a survey of youth in Japan um, who really indicated that they were in need of a safe space or a safer space um, during the pandemic. So in, to uh, facilitate even virtually having a space to which um, people could go and receive support um, to receive allyship uh, within a pandemic and time of lockdown was really important. So I think that the, um, the pandemic itself had really shifted the discourse around diversity and inclusion. That was, uh, you know, one of the key jazzed up, wonderful moments that was going to be happening with the Olympics. And there was a lot of, uh, a lot of um, kind of consternation and, um, around that in relation to, for example, the opening ceremony. Any Olympic Games has, uh, you know, really difficult um, scandals to get over. And there were a couple of those that happened in relation to the opening ceremony. Um, and uh, this also kind of indicates the, the kind of the, the mismatch between this um, glitzy, shiny, uh, sparkling diversity and inclusion and what's happening at a time when um, there is real trauma on the ground where people are restricted in movement, they cannot leave the country, they cannot enter the country, they cannot visit their friends, relatives, receive the support that they can. What does diversity and inclusion mean in that context is something that I think um, the queer community too has been grappling with. And one of the ways of doing that, um, for example, the Pride House Initiative, and also, for example, uh, the Tokyo University Komaba campus also have a, has a safer space, and that was run virtually um, during the pandemic as well. So um, in regards to how things have changed or impacted on the boom, um, I think that the boom itself became uh, less of a boom because of the pandemic, there were other things that were more important. And then that's the problem, right? There's always, there's always this thing like it's not the most important thing in a time of crisis, when we know that in a time of crisis, support for queer people is so fundamentally important. We know that from experiences around the 2011 earthquake, from the Corbe earthquake, we know that in crisis, we need to give support 
for peoples of diverse gender and sexuality, and it's really incredibly important. But because things happen in a boom, they can be a fad, a trend, and then it's off because the new thing is coming up. And I think that's part of really what I want to impress um, through my talk today. I think I've been a bit disjointed. I don't know if I've made um, a really good uh, explanation, given a good explanation or made a uh, convincing argument and I'd be really happy to engage with any questions or comments that you might have at all um, via email if you'd so like to do. Thank you for that. We just have about two minutes left and I have one final question. Uh, Dr. Jackson asked, what types of research, if any, would you like to encourage for graduate students with regards to these issues? Or what kind of research would you be excited to see emerge? Any research, any research on queer issues from a queer perspective, really. But we have a lot of work to do. I'm a language person, so I would love for people to work in the nexus of language and social issues, language and social justice. I'm a language educator and we need better textbooks. We need more understanding in the classroom. I would love for people to come and join part of, of uh, with colleagues um, in Canada and the, and the US and Australia. We formed a network um, around gender and sexual diversity in, the, in Japanese language education. I would love to, for people to come and be a part of that, to share, and to make change. There's a lot of really exciting happening uh, things happening around gender justice in language education at the moment. And that's another thing that I would really love to see. Um, we had this boom, or, but we need to actually make sure that the changes continue. And, and that's how it's operated. The advocacy and uh, has continued even in these periods that haven't been seen as booms. So to take advantage of the boom, but also to continue with the good work that has already been done. Thanks. Well, great. Thank you for that final answer. And it looks like we're just hitting time. So uh, thank you so much, Dr. Marie, for being here and speaking today. Uh, thank you to everyone for joining us and for your wonderful questions. And we hope you have a wonderful evening and look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Thanks very much.